And welcome everybody to uh, this introductory webinar on the Law and Policy Coordination Center. Um, we have a great team here today and we're really excited to introduce ourselves to you all and let you know what you can expect from us over the next several years. Uh, many of you may know me. I'm Lindsay Freitas. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy here um, in California. I'm located in Sacramento and I uh, work with, at the American Lung Association. You all probably know me from my work on the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing, and I'm really excited to embark on this new grant uh, with an amazing team at the Public Health Law Center. So we're really excited to introduce ourselves to you today and let you know how you can work with us, how you can contact us, and what we can do to kind of help you guys do the amazing work that you're all doing at the local level. So we're, we're I can't say it enough, we're just very excited about this. Um, this is really a joint effort between the American Lung Association and the Public Health Law Center. Um, we've had a really wonderful time uh, working on creating this grant together and figuring out how to work together and bring you guys the services that you uh, need and benefit from and figuring out how we can best support you. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you guys have any questions, uh, go ahead and enter it into the, the chat box and we'll answer all of those questions at the end. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. We're happy to answer anything. Um, get used to it. Get used to asking us questions because that's what we want to do. We want to answer your questions and help you. Um, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Karina Camacho, who's actually going to be leading up our efforts uh, for the Lung Association on this. And she's going to talk a little bit more about uh, what you can expect. So take yeah. it away, Karina. Oh, yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, so as Lindsay mentioned, I'll be kind of um, the project director managing this project um, here in California. And I'm very, very excited to work with you all. Um, I uh, have previously worked in California, obviously, with the um, Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing, very familiar with tobacco policy across the state. So um, with this new grant that we're working on, we're going to be doing some of the similar work um, as the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing are familiar with that, but we're going to be focusing more on the policy aspect of things. We are still going to be providing the same type of TA, able to talk about what are strong policies, um, get into the policy provisions, going to be providing a lot of the same trainings. One thing that we will not be doing on this grant is doing the uh, matrices. That's how you think that um, it's going to be different, but again, we're still talking about the policy and the really exciting thing that we're all really looking forward to here in California is looking a lot at the implementation aspect and how we can best help your, your campaigns as well as after the, the campaign is passed and make sure we tackle all those challenges. And it gives us a lot of opportunity to dive in deeper than we did before. We're going to still be doing some documents related to policy implementation and producing those and handing those out to, to the field, doing some case studies on policy implementation. That's really exciting. As I mentioned, we are also doing policy trainings, Policy 101. We're able to come out to your coalition, to regional meetings, and explain to your community members how policy works, get the nuts and bolts of it. We are hiring staff in Southern California. Um, Lindsay and I are located in Sacramento, but we do want to have staff throughout the state to be able to help you and provide that TA. Um, we're hoping to hire someone in the Los Angeles area. And once that happens, we'll obviously let you all know. And that'll be great to have someone in that part of the woods, right? Um, like I mentioned, the policy implementation. And another really cool aspect of this grant is that we are having office hours where we're hoping to travel throughout the state and do TA on the spot, right? To be able to attend regional meetings, coalition meetings, and answer any TA questions you might have. Sometimes a little intimidating to maybe shoot, shoot a phone call, shoot an email, but once you see that person there, you're able to say, wait, I really don't understand the tobacco retail licensing. Can you explain that little small detail, right? What's the difference between suspension and revocation? How does that look like? And we'll be able to answer that on the spot, as well as connect you with um, our, our legal folks out in Minnesota and either set up calls for other future TA, maybe have a video chat right then and there to answer those um, small little questions. And that's kind of a really cool aspect of our office hours that we're gonna be providing throughout the state. And as I mentioned, gonna have staff all over, which is gonna be really great. Uh, we're gonna to continue to work with uh, the coordination centers and to really tackle those equity issues, diversity issues, especially when we look at policy implementation, like I said, something that we're super, super excited about, because I think that 
it, when policies really get into the nitty gritty of what's actually happening, that's where we start to see some of those equity issues, especially when we talk about smoke-free multi-unit housing, right? A lot of people talk about implementation issues with that, um, hoping to engage a lot of non-traditional partners in these conversations and working with everyone, again, on the policy development aspect, policy implementation. I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's kind of the, the big part that the American Lung Association will be providing. Again, we're here to answer all of your questions. You can always um, give me a phone call, email me. Um, again, I will be the kind of project director, main point of contact um, here in California, and uh, easily as well the uh, lawyers in, in Minnesota are as well as accessible, and you can contact them. And I'll let them speak more about what they're doing on um, this project, and yeah, I'll let you all take it away over there. Great. Thank you, Karina. Um, okay, I wasn't sure if it was all, all the way turned over. I'm Joelle Lester. I'm the Director of Commercial Tobacco Control Law and Policy here at the Public Health Law Center. We are so excited to work with ALA, with Lindsay and Karina, to support the fantastic work that all of you are doing to protect health in your communities in California. Um, although the Public Health Law Center may be new to you, we are not new to public health or to tobacco control. We were founded in 2000 and we're located at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. We have two major program areas, so tobacco control is our, um, was our initial issue area, and we also have added a program area in healthy eating and active living law and policy. In all of our work in both program areas, we uh, work to advance health equity and health justice. And what that means is we try to think through the implications of any policy option for communities that are disproportionately harmed um, by tobacco use in our case or by other factors. So the public health harms and also other societal harms um, that, that can arise when policy isn't designed to best protect health for all parts of a community. Um, our tobacco control program is pretty big. We have four, 14 full-time attorneys working on tobacco control law and policy around the country. With support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we work with states and communities all throughout the United States. Um, we um, also have a state-specific program here in Minnesota, so we have a couple of attorneys who devote their time and attention to helping advanced tobacco control policy change for Minnesota communities. So we have both the experience and perspective of working with folks all around the country, um, and then also the experience and perspective of working deeply and closely in partnership with communities in one particular state to protect those communities from tobacco use. Um, during our 20 years of work in tobacco control, we've amassed significant expertise. We have many, many years of experience represented here with the attorneys on our team. We have an enormous set of resources on our website that are available to you in the form of publications and archived webinars. And we look forward to creating and tailoring new resources to serve California communities um, under this project and in partnership with um, ALA. So we're really excited to work with you all. And um, there's a couple of things we think we bring to the table um, with the California Legal Technical Assistance Program um, that might be new to all of you. I, our work with um, communities around the country gives us a great perspective on trends in tobacco control policy change, also on tobacco industry tactics in opposing policy change, and um, what happens in litigation. So we can um, best give information to California communities to help you design policies that achieve your public health goals and also that can withstand litigation challenges. So we're really excited to add um, this piece of work to the work that we're already doing. In addition, we um, are fortunate to be in the position to have a number of strategic initiatives. So we are able to think about what are the big legal questions that need to be thought through to take tobacco control policy change to the next level around the country. Um, and what tool are we leaving on the table that we could um, figure out how to use to protect health. Um, and one of those projects is our FDA tobacco project. And I'm not gonna talk about that right this minute because my colleague Desmond Jensen is going to do so for you in just a few moments. In addition, we've been leaders in the national end game policy conversation. We convene meetings to think through First Amendment challenges and how to get at tobacco industry uh, marketing and advertising. Um, and we also have um, been able to create forums for state tobacco program managers to get together and troubleshoot to um, think about what tobacco industry tactics they need to watch out for and to come up with even better solutions to um, advance policy change in their states. 
So we're really excited to bring all of that national thinking, the national perspective, the strategic leadership and connections to bear to inform and improve legal technical assistance that we provide to you in California. We are really in awe of the state and local leadership um, and policy progress in California and the amazing resources that you're able to devote to tobacco control policy change and to ending the tobacco epidemic in California. We are incredibly excited to be part of this um, work in California and we just can't wait to get started. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, Mark Meany and Andrew Tunamatsiko to tell you more about our legal technical assistance. Great, thanks, Joelle. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us and for giving us this opportunity. I don't want to sound too redundant, but it's hard not to. Um, but I just I do want to echo what um, Lindsay and Karina and Joel all have said about how excited we are to get started. And I, and I, I say that, but we already are started. I, uh, we've been receiving a number of TA requests already, which has been um, fantastic that people have already found us and um, are posing questions. And so I do want to talk just a little bit about um, the work that I do. I am um, an attorney here. I lead our National Legal Technical Assistance Program. I just want to talk a bit for a few minutes about what that entails uh, before talking, giving it over to Andrew, who will also talk about our, our technical assistance program. Uh, but I do also want to say it's really so, so exciting to us to work with uh, communities and advocacy organizations and a uh, health department that is so committed to um, really moving forward to end tobacco use in the state of California. So we can't wait to, to get to get started. As you all said, um, for almost the past 20 years, um, our bread and butter activity here at the uh, Public Health Law Center has been um, to provide free, individualized um, legal technical assistance um, to almost anybody who asks us uh, questions from around the country. And I think the individualized piece is really, really important to us. We have found that um, every question is unique in its own way. And so while we draw from our experiences uh, working around the country, we know that, um, that it's important to understand the local issues that are involved with every question. And so um, that's a really key part of, of all of the work that we do. Um, and also, um, the other part that, and Joel mentioned this as well, that's really um, fundamental to all of our work is that because we are working in, a, in an area where an industry, the industry has been so um, direct in its targeting of certain, certain populations, communities of color, lower income communities, um, tribal nations, um, and kids, that health equity is, it's incumbent upon us to make health equity a fundamental part of all the work that we do. Um, without doing that, we will not be able to achieve our goals of reducing the health disparities that result from tobacco use. Um, so, giving, you know, as Joel mentioned, our team is um, a wonderful group of, I promise you, extraordinarily, extremely nice, um, dedicated, and intelligent attorneys. And we come from a, a wide variety of backgrounds. And so, our work at the center, um, we try to be generalists within the, the um, tobacco control. Um, in responding to TA requests. So we all have a little bit of experience in everything, but we all come, at, come with different legal backgrounds prior to, to um, coming to the center. And we have people with, um, with public health backgrounds, with um, environmental backgrounds, with municipal law, um, with tax law, public policy. Um, and then we have, we have litigators, we have um, transactional lawyers. And so we all you know, really work together. And I think that that robust um, set of experience has, it really helps to inform all the work that we do here. So moving on to the, the TA piece, what we talk about when we, uh, when we talk about legal technical assistance is, I mean, it's kind of a, a, a diverse set of, um, of assistance. Uh, the, the primary questions that we often get are, are communities will contact us or a state will contact us um, and, and, and just say, you know, kind of give us an, an idea of what they want to do. You know, can we do this? We would like to implement a flavor policy or we want to, um, enact you know, establish a tobacco reach of a license thing. And so we will kind of help to, to identify all those, the issues that are related. Is there adequate authority to do that? Um, who else has done that? You know, we, we, we keep a, a pretty good track of who's doing what around the country. Has there been um, any litigation? What, you know, what's the evidence base? Are, you know, are these policies effective? Does it fit within your, your existing uh, structure? How best you know can can you do that? You know all these are questions that we can help to answer and to you know to, to frame for folks. Um, you know, kind of at the at the first part, we want to make sure that we are we are um, coming up with and helping people to develop policies that are doing what they want them to do and that are going to be effective in reducing tobacco use. 
the next step is often reviewing language um, or, or, or developing language for, for um, communities or for states. And so again, we want to make sure that the policy is going to do what, what you want it to do, that it's using the most updated definitions, that, you know, that, that the enforcement provisions are adequate. Um, you know, so we do try to make sure that the evidence base is strong and that we are, um, we are really at the forefront. And that's, again, part that's informed from working throughout the country. We are always learning and learning from the industry, which is very, um, you know, facile and, 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 and adaptable um, and innovative. Um, so it requires us to keep on our toes and make sure that we are um, at the cutting edge. So we want to make sure that as, and again, as you all said, we want to make sure that policies are um, doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're going to be effective in reducing tobacco use, and also that they are going to, um, you know, that we're going to, they're going to be in the best position to either avoid litigation, uh, which is, you know, it's a litigious industry um, that we're dealing with, or if, if that's not always feasible, um, that they're going to be that we're going to put you in the best position to um, to succeed in the event that there is litigation. So that's kind of the you know one part of the TA that we provide, and often that helps to inform the other pieces that we do, and that can be uh, helping to identify areas where there's a need for training. And so what we do with all of our work um, is make sure that we are you know tailoring it to the audience. So we want to make sure you know we we want to make sure that it's it's, it's effective and it's useful for whoever is um, is is requesting the information. So. And we do a wide variety of trainings all around the country on all kinds of issues, the whole, the whole gamut of tobacco control issues. And we'll talk more about that. I think Andrew will talk a little bit more about that um, as we go on. And then also, as, as you also mentioned, we have a lot of publications. They're one of the largest um, libraries of tobacco control publications in the country. And so as we get a number of requests, we, you know, we, we realize it helps us to, to understand where the need is and where we can um, develop publications on a particular issue or where it is you know, important for us to update our existing publications. And this is something that we'll be working very closely with you, with you all, hopefully, on, um, as we start to develop more publications specifically for, um, for California grantees. We also provide litigation support. Um, so while we don't do any direct client representation, we do uh, primarily this is in the form of amicus or friend of the court briefs. And those are typically in cases where there is um, some national significance and we wanna make sure that the public health interest is represented on the court record. We will um, file an amicus brief or join with other public health organizations in filing an amicus brief. Um, the product that we, that we provide to you is really, again, it's. Um, we try to be as flexible as we possibly can. That's really important to us and as individualized as we can. So um, depending on what the requester's needs are, um, the timing, uh, who the audience is, I mean, all those kind of factor into our development of, of our assistance. And so it could be often starting with a phone call and sometimes it's just, it's, it's a quick question, can we do this with their federal preemption? Um, but it, you know, it, it can lead, uh, you know, as you go down the continuum to email responses to a formal memo if that's required and again or to, you know, training or something else like that. So it's again, um, whatever the needs are, we will find a way to meet those. And just to talk about, you know, kind of just how we've been structured um, to date and how this might, um, you know, how, how we see this uh, in terms of how it will work for um, for California as we're, as we're um, starting to, 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 uh, to work with all of you. Um, as you also, we've been doing national TA work for almost 20 years, and we work in we've done work in every state in the country. We we tend to work in about 47 states now, I think, um, and so that allows us to have a good sense of what's going on around the country, which policies are being implemented, where they are, um, who's you know kind of what the differentiations are, and we learn what's effective where there are, you know, what, what we can learn, where there are um, areas that can be improved upon. And we, you know, we kind of synthesize all that information internally and try to come up with the best, um, you know, help us to inform us, inform our work to provide the best assistance going forward. Um, we keep track of where there's been litigation, what that means in terms of how we, um, we, we structure and how we set up um, draft language. Uh, and then also we do work with um, researchers as well to make sure that we understand the evidence base. We, we wanna make sure that what we're doing again is going to have as much of an impact as possible. So that's more of a high level. We obviously, we, we, um, we aren't, we, we, because we're working in so many states that uh, we don't, um, we aren't experts in the law of every state, but again, as over 20 years, we have worked in all the states um, quite a bit. So we do have a fair amount of knowledge, but then we also have this other, um, contract with the Minnesota Department of Health, which is 
much more um, intensive and we work with, with um, local grantees and um, provide a higher level of uh, much more detailed um, technical assistance and, and drafting of ordinances and working with communities at a, at a, you know, at, at a much higher level. And that's really the model that we see um, working, you know, we're hoping to, will work for California, but again, as I want to encourage you, if things are, you know, as, as we are, as we are moving forward, this is going to be new for all of us. Um, we would really welcome any, uh, any insights you have on how to, you know, how to best work with, with folks in California, because I think that, um, you know, it's, we are, we are open to learning, but the, you know, our Minnesota model has worked really well because we, what we do is, um, and this is kind of what we're planning here in California. Is most of our attorneys are going to be working with you. Are going to be doing um, a certain percentage. You know, half to three quarters of their work will be in California. But we also like to have that um, a portion of their work to be done at the national level because we really think that uh, that that kind of helps to inform um, the work in both directions. And I think it's really it's, it's useful for ultimately coming up with the best um, the best policy solutions. But again, flexibility is is, is um, important to us, and I think it's it's um, it's incumbent upon us to, to continue that and to work with you in the best way that work that, that um, to give you the best product that you can. Um, and I also want to say that while we are new in this role in California, we have done quite a bit of work in California. So we aren't um, you know we aren't starting entirely from scratch. We have uh, done uh, quite a bit of work with a number of communities in California in a variety of areas on. First Amendment questions on um, the intersection of marijuana and tobacco laws, um, just to name a few. And we are, um, we've done some work on amicus briefs on a couple of, of key cases in California, the um, Soda Warning uh, labeling case in San Francisco was one, uh, one of those. We also um, are doing some research projects with Stanford University on point of sale policies, which again, those, those help to inform our you know, the evidence base of the policies that we are working on. And then I would say that we've had a really wonderful and um, long standing relationship with the California Department of Public Health, uh, April, Rich, um, Tanya, and, um, and Liz, just to name a few, um, which has been wonderful and we can't wait to, uh, to continue that. And then finally, the last piece of this, I think is, you know, we are super excited to be partnering with ALA on this because we know that they, um, Know the landscape and have the knowledge of the, um, the, the and, and, and will help us develop the most important partnerships throughout the state. And so I think that is going to be um, you know, a wonderful partnership going forward for the next five years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Andrew Tumasico, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, the TA. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, as Mark said, my name is Andrew Tumasico. I'm a staff attorney here at the Public Health Law Center, working on the tobacco team. And to sing the same song that's been sung here and will continue to be heard is that we are very, very excited. I'm personally very, very excited to be working and partnering with ALA to work in California, a state that's been at the forefront of adopting and implementing innovative policies of tobacco control. And we are excited to be part of that vanguard as we set a model or bear the banner for the rest of the nation to help move the tobacco control policies that we champion uh, across the nation and specifically California. So moving on to talk about the technical ecosystems that we provide and Mark highlighted some of the, a lot of the areas that we touch on, but I wanted to talk about, just give you a, an idea of the work that we do based on the people that we partner with and the types of areas that we focus on. Uh, Mark has talked about different public health uh, officials and agencies that we've worked with. We've worked with a wide range of groups from the local to the national level, including tribal and state health officials. Um, Mark talked about the work that we've done with the Minnesota Department of Health, and we've done that not just in Minnesota, but in North Dakota. We've done that in Kansas, in Florida, and to name but a few. And what basically what we do is that a wide range of things from policy reviews, to developing toolkits, to developing model policies, which uh, communities can take and tailor to it to fit their community goals, but based on the evidence, based on the best practices that we glean from our practice across the nation. And as Mark also pointed out, um, we although we really haven't typically worked in California, our connection and interactions with the California Department of Public Health 
uh, is is longstanding. We've had contacts there with Rich Kwong and April Rissler. So we we really hope to continue and ground this relationship, build this relationship to continue to deliver uh, public health goals and doing so in an equitable uh, fashion. Uh, so we also work with advocacy organizations. Uh, relationship with the ALA is not just uh, a product of our work that we anticipate to do in California and what we've been doing in California. We've worked not just with the ALA, but also national major um, organizations that are invested in tobacco control, uh, advocacy organizations like the American CASA Society, the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, the Truth Initiative, uh, the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, uh, the Foundation for Americans for Non Smokers' Rights, to name but a few. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is our partnership with not just those organizations, but organizations that represent uh, people who are underrepresented. Uh, for example, we have a long standing relationship with the uh, National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, NAPEN, and the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, AATCLC. And our relationship with working with them has helped us uh, collaborate to prioritize the fight against uh, menthol in tobacco, which, has dispro which is disproportionately used and affects both racial and sexual minorities. So it's on those relationships that we pride ourselves on and we, 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 we are hoping to continue to develop in our work in California. Um, then we also work with government attorneys, uh, county attorneys, uh, city attorneys, and also uh, we have a good relationship with the National Association of Attorneys General. We help, for example, in the city and county level, we work with uh, although these are entities that are represented by city attorneys, they tend to be generally focusing on the whole wide range of uh, local government relations, but we bring our expertise in tobacco control to help support those attorneys and their departments of health in order to craft policies that will uh, engender public health and uh, make to, to just support them in that role, not that we know better, but also work collaboratively with them. Um, at the National Association of Attorneys General, my our colleagues, my colleagues have been uh, our usual participants in that. On at least on a bi-monthly bi basis, we're invited to talk about things like taxation of tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, flavor pro products, and raising the minimum sales legal age. So it's really um, we we draw from a wide range of expertise to have conversations and bring uh, this expertise to our communities in California. And we also work with researchers. Although we are a group of attorneys, our, we don't necessarily just promote uh, normative policies because they, they just make sense or an ideal legal sense. Our work is informed by uh, science and the best practices that are out there. So we work with different researchers in California specifically. We work with researchers like Lisa Henriksen from uh, Stanford. We work with uh, researchers from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Barry Liega is one of them. Uh, Stan Glantz, uh, Ruth Malone, so to name but a few. And we also work with um, researchers from the from San Diego State University and outside California, also just different universities, the like University of North Carolina, Washington University. And so really our work is informed by science. It's just that work that we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to advance in uh, working towards health in California. And also, as Mark mentioned, of course, our TA is individualized. We have worked with different communities. Uh, people will pick up the phone and say, um, oh my goodness, I'm having smoke infiltrate in my in my living space, what can I do? And my child has asthma, oh, I have COPD, what can you do? And it is that individualized approach that we use, not necessarily in a sense to give legal advice, but to also draw from my uh, experience to give education information on what they can do in their, uh, in their situation to address those aspects. And also, you know, property owners or common interest communities were, were seeking to make their grounds smoke free uh, is uh, some of the work that we do. Uh, so moving on to the topic areas and Mark touched, about those, touched on those and we will continue to explore those. But the point of sale has been a really major focus in tobacco control. Um, things like restrictions of, on the sale of flavored products, which 
California has been really uh, at the forefront of and uh, also licensing and selling uh, tobacco products by pharmacies. Those are some of the areas that we work on and will draw from to continue to, um, to ensure that we are promoting public health and uh, tobacco control in California. And so um, another area that is at the core of the work that we do is preemption. We uh, emphasize local control in, uh, in tobacco regulation. We believe that the best policies are developed and implemented on the local level. It is those innovative policies on the local level that diffuse horizontally to other communities or vertically to uh, the national and, uh, and the federal, to the state and national level and uh, promote public health for everybody. Not only do we really care about that because uh, it, it, it is innovative, we also believe that it is centered in equity and health equity is something that we care about. We not only seek to uh, eliminate and minimize disparities in health on, and uh, equitable dispensation of positive public health outcomes, we believe that the process of achieving those policies should be participatory. And that's why we are really intent about ensuring meaningful, authentic community engagement that is participatory. It is in that way that we ensure that people have a stake in their own health, which will go, at, go longer to legitimate those policies and create easy enforcement. And that's really why we are so grounded in working with local communities uh, and, and, and uh, underrepresented communities and to ensure that we are promoting health equity. And with that being said, I would let my colleague Mike Freiberg talk more about that. Thank you, Andrew, appreciate it. Um, I'm Mike Freiberg, I'm a senior staff attorney uh, with the Public Health Law Center. Um, like everybody else, not to sound like a broken record, but I'm really <laughs> excited to begin doing this work at, at this level of detail with California communities. It's really exciting to be working with a progressive community that's working on lots of innovative policies and it makes us as public health attorneys really excited to be working on this groundbreaking work that all of you are doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work with uh, tribal nations um, and advocates working with Native American populations. Uh, California has the largest Native American population of any state. There's 110 federally recognized tribes. There's 80 or so more that are seeking federal recognition. So it's really important to give you some examples of our work, but even more important, I would say, than that is just to tell you the approach we take in doing this work. Um, you know, and to start with, it's important just to emphasize that we are a non-tribal organization. So ideally, we can work with tribal partners and tribal community leaders to help tribes exercise their sovereignty to protect public health. Um, but, you know, just again, we are a non-tribal organization. Many of us have uh, taken audited classes related to federal Indian law and tribal law. We are based out of a law school, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, that has some of the foremost experts on tribal law and federal Indian law in the country. Um, we've audited the classes. We've done everything we can to build our expertise in this area. But just coming back to that limitation of our not being a, a tribally led organization, we may not be the appropriate entity to work on a specific tribal policy. And that can be because of historical trauma, that can be because of institutional racism, and we recognize there will be situations where we need to step aside to let tribal partners exclusively work on an issue. In any case, we recognize that tribal partners and tribal community members must take the lead for there to be community buy-in for a policy. Uh, and when we do this work, we work with partners and fellow TA providers following the lead of tribal TA partners and tribal communities. Um, you know, and we know you've worked, you'll be working and have worked with the American Indian Coordinating Center at ETR. We've had a preliminary call with them and we look forward to working with them um, at a, in more depth and we're excited to be working with them as well as with groups like ALA that have done a lot of important work in this area. Um, and there are unique issues when you're working uh, with commercial tobacco control policies in the tribal context um, that we try to be sensitive to whenever we can. Certainly, um, we strive at every point to fight for tribal sovereignty, um, even, in, even in situations where it might come into conflict with, uh, with some of our public health goals, we recognize that that's an overarching value that we have to protect. Uh, we recognize that there are tribal communities that have a history um, of sacred tobacco use. 
And we need to make it clear that our goal is not to restrict that in any way. Um, what the issue that we're concerned about is uh, related to commercial tobacco. So we work on commercial tobacco control policies. Um, just to give you some examples of some of the work that we've done, um, we've worked directly with advocates um, in certain communities. Um, one example of that where we worked in uh, pretty extensively is with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. Um, a early on an advocate working on the reservation there was connected with us um, and was interested in getting some comments on a draft ordinance that a committee there consisting of elders and other public health advocates working on the reservation had put together. Uh, so we were able to draw on some of the expertise um, at the law school we're based out of, uh, some of our expertise working on to the commercial tobacco control policies, um, provided some comments on the draft, which uh, the advocates there um, acknowledged strengthened the ordinance and were happy with the work. We, uh, we, we were even able to go to the tribal council meeting when the ordinance was considered. Um, it took sort of a few years for that process to play out, but eventually they, the council did adopt one of the strongest tribal commercial tobacco control and smoke-free policies um, in the nation. So we were really excited to be a part of that work. Um, we've worked um, in the Southwest. Uh, we've worked with Navajo, with advocates working with uh, the policy in Navajo Nation, smoke-free policy there. Um, that's been an ongoing process, um, working um, on a bunch of different campaigns there, whether through the tribal council or the executive order or an, initi an initiative campaign. So. You know, there's 573 or so uh, federally recognized tribes all over the country. They all have different processes in working on these. So we try to you know, recognize that and recognize that some approaches that may work in one community may not work in another community. Uh, we worked with some of the leading uh, public health organizations that work uh, with uh, tribal lands. The National Indian Health Board is an organization we have a close relationship with. Uh, we've collaborated on publications with them. We've presented at their conference at their conferences numerous times, um, and so you know we try to work with them whenever possible on these. Uh, there are tribal epidemiology centers um, all over the country. We've done some work with those in our region here in Minnesota. The Great Lakes Intertribal Epidemiology Center is, uh, is an organization we've worked with. They're one of our funders, um, and we've done some work both in the healthy, healthy eating, active living area, um, as well as in the commercial tobacco control area. Uh, the Intertribal Council of Arizona has invited us down to present a couple times in which we've done that. Um, and we're hoping to build a relationship as part of this work with the California Tribal Epidemiology Center. Um, so um, going forward, we'll be reaching out to them, I'm sure. Um, that's just sort of a very broad level overview of some of the work we've done with tribal communities. Um, but we did want to acknowledge that because it's such an important area um, and uh, there's such a large number of communities in California, so we're excited to be doing that work as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Desmond Jensen. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> my name is Desmond Jensen. I'm a senior staff attorney here at the Public Health Law Center, uh, and I work on our FDA tobacco project. As Joelle mentioned at the beginning, it's one of our projects that we think really adds a lot of value to the work we do. So if you've been following the FDA's regulation tobacco products at all or attempted, you've probably been pretty confused. Uh, there's a lot going on. The FDA's communications are pretty jargon heavy, and they tend to copy and paste a lot of statutory regulatory language, and their processes span a period of years, and so it's often hard to figure out where exactly they are in the process. And that's where we come in. And there's really two major components to our, pro to our project. The one that's going to be the most visible to you is our role as an intermediary between the FDA and the greater public health community. So all of those communications that come out, we will translate for you and pick out the stuff that you really need to know about and weed it from the stuff that is less important. So we'll create short publications, one to three pages, on topics that you just need to know the high level. On issues where you need to know a lot more information, we'll dig a little deeper and do a webinar or two. So all of that information lives on our website, which I'm going to plug lots of times. But if you go to our FDA Tobacco Action Center, that's really going to be your one-stop shop for information. And we've really been the go-to resource for the FDA's regulation of tobacco products since about 2012. And the FDA has really been only regulating tobacco products since 2009. So all of that information lives in one spot. You'll find all of our publications and our webinars, our translation of what the FDA puts out. And the other part of the flip side of that coin is that when the FDA is looking, information, 
or information from the public health community, we're going to give you that information as well. Make sure you know when you can come into the FDA, what the deadline is, and what sort of information is relevant. We don't really draft template comments that you can sign your name to and submit. Instead, what we do is give you talking points to use in drafting your own comments to the FDA. Uh, those template comments of the FDA really aren't all that helpful. What they're looking for is specific information. So we'll help you to draft comments. We'll look at, at drafts of your comments uh, before you submit them. If you go to our website, the most important thing you'll see is my contact information and that co the contact information from my colleague Natalie Henrich. And we are always happy to answer questions about FDA regulation or how what the FDA is working on might be important or not important to you in your community. So that's one component of our project, sort of being an intermediary. The other major component is our own advocacy uh, with the FDA. So I don't just sit in my office and read the Federal Register. We actually go out to hearings and meetings in Washington, D.C. We have regular calls with staff at the FDA at regular meetings. We're also working with a lot of researchers who are funded by the FDA to build a scientific evidence base for FDA action. So our project has a couple of priorities that we use uh, to really think about uh, and push the FDA. We're really always pushing the FDA to think bigger and to act bolder. So since the beginning of our project, we've been pushing the FDA to regulate all products as stringently as it regulates cigarettes and smokeless tobacco, because it wasn't really regulating anything other than those project products until about 2016. Uh, another big component of our project is pushing the FDA to be more transparent and to provide more access to the agency especially for people who are outside of Washington, D.C., like us and you all in California. Uh, and the other component of our project, is, or the other, other goal for our advocacy to the FDA, is getting the FDA to prohibit menthol and cigarettes, which is worth spending a moment to talk about. Uh, because first, it really is a microcosm for the sort of relationship where our FDA project and our legal technical assistance really benefit each other. And also because it's a really important priority for us, uh, given the importance of health equity at our organization. So in the early days of our project, we reached out to folks we knew in the state and local, at the state and local level, because of the relationships we've built over the years. To ask them what our priorities should be for our FDA work. And menthol came up often, particularly people who are working on minority health issues. So we knew that had to be one of our priorities. And one of the things that we've done is file a formal petition requesting the FDA to prohibit menthol and cigarettes. And as a part of that process, we really built a broad national coalition on that issue. And we also collected a lot of scientific information. So even though the FDA hasn't actually acted on menthol, the building of that coalition, I think, really moved the efforts forward. Uh, and we're really seeing the, the benefits of that at the local level now, finally. So it was important for us to hear from advocates who work on menthol and amplify their voice at the FDA. And even though we haven't been successful there, that work has really supercharged what we do at the local level. So that's really important to us. Um, so before I turn it over to Andrew uh, to moderate the question and answer, I really just want to emphasize that uh, what we're doing, even if you don't actually ever call me to ask me questions about the FDA's regulation of tobacco products, we think that that the, the knowledge we have gained really informs a lot of the other technical assistance we do. So our perspective of working with local governments, state governments, tribal organizations, and the federal government really gives us a unique perspective that you don't have other places. And again, I'll just say, if there's anything you want to know about the FDA's regulation of tobacco products, feel free to go to our website, and definitely always feel free to contact me or Natalie Hamrick. I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you, Desmond. Um, yeah, so as Lynn has said initially, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, type them in, in the chat box and we'll be answering them. Um, there is a question regarding, um, <laughs> just a second, we're having a technical glitch around here. Learning model policy. Um, there is a question on how, and Mark, I'll, I'll direct this question to you. How are you going to be helping working on implementation? Can you give an example? Sure, I can. Thanks, Andrew. Um, 
before I, I, I answer that, though, I do, I do want to say, um, just in case I don't have a chance to forget, um, that we want to make sure that it's as easy uh, to contact us as it can possibly be. So I encourage you, if you have a question, you can contact anybody um, on our staff, anybody on this panel. Uh, if you go to our website, we now have a California-specific page that we are um, just in the process of developing, but it is available. And um, there's also there's a link there uh, to my email address, and so you can feel free to contact me, and I'll make sure that the right person gets the question. So. Um, in terms of contacting us with, with TA questions, whatever works for you um, will be will work well for us. We just want to make sure that it's uh, we're as successful as possible. Um, sorry, moving into the, the actual question. Um, this is a, this, I think this is a, a great question. I'm glad it's it's um, being asked because we often um, we often see draft policies or draft ordinances that don't have any implementation or any enforcement component to it, and so. Um, I think probably the flavor uh, policies are the best example of how we have worked with, uh, with communities in trying to develop a way to, um, to implement the policies. And um, I think this is unfortunately still a work in progress because of, again, I think because of the, uh, the ability of the tobacco industry to, uh, you know, develop kinds of flavors and, and, and you know, really Come up with ways to evade the policies, but we do try to help work with whatever is, you know, where we are now at the, uh, you know, in, in, in what we would see as kind of the cutting edge in terms of um, in developing language that has been vetted uh, by the, the courts um, and working with jurisdictions. And in this case, what we've done is we've convened uh, conversations among other jurisdictions that have these policies and to talk about the best ways to implement them. Um, because we don't have all the answers, and I think it's the people on the ground who really um, can help to answer those most effectively. Um, so I don't know if that's answering the question specifically, but I think you know I think this is definitely a um, the implementation piece is something that's that's extremely important to us, and it's something that we you know that we will work with you individually on. But often it's it's you know part of our role is then to convene the resources available and to talk through what um, what sort of the issues that other jurisdictions have encountered. Um, but we do have some publications, you know, we we are we do um, include that as part of all of our, our work as well. Um, I don't know if that's if that's sufficient or not. For those that have pieces to add, Karina, did you, Karina, you had talked a little bit about implementation support. Did you want to chime in? Yeah, I'd love to chime in. So one thing that I'm really excited, again, we're all excited here, um, to dive into is implementation of smoke-free multi-unit housing policies. Um, I think that we can look at how different communities are handling their complaints. I think that a lot of times a policy has things on the enforcement and who's going to be in charge of it, but the complaint process is something that I think we want to dive into more in terms of um, looking at, well, how does a resident who has a neighbor who's smoking, what do they do? Who do they contact first? Um, does the enforcement agency come out and provide a test? Like what are those little nuances? And then um, ultimately what is the process to say, okay, this person is smoking, how are we gonna start the enforcement aspect of it? I think there is a little gap right there we wanna dive into more is um, how we go from someone smoking in their apartment and then from the, when we're we actually going to go into the board for that complaint. So I'm um, talking to local communities that have already passed those policies and seeing what were some of the problems with it, um, you know, the challenges that they're going through and best advise other communities on how they can develop their implementation plans um, for smoke-free multi-unit housing. That's something that I really want to dive into. Great. Um, second question, and I'll take for a stab at it if you're here to chime in. Um, are there any model policies for tobacco, specifically citywide ESIC bans that you can share? Great question. Um, historically, the communities that we've worked with, uh, for example, Minnesota and Kansas, we typically don't develop model policies because we believe that individualized, tailored approach to uh, specific problems is the best approach. So we tend to stay away from developing model policies because we don't believe in one size fits all. But we have occasionally worked on developing uh, policies but we also put a dis we also try to emphasize that before you can't just take this policy and run with it. Please contact us, contact your city attorney or contact an attorney that you work with. This is mainly for educational purposes to see, try to embody best policies. So there is no 
model policy per se that, uh, that we'll share right now, not even California specific, but we hope that in developing a uh, relationship and a work in California, we will work towards uh, developing certain policies. Again, not really as a model policy that you will adopt per se, but one that would give pointers in ways to go, but also work with, in collaboration with other stakeholders and us involved in a way we can work towards tailoring it to meet specific goals. Uh, I, I totally agree with what Andrew said. I, I, we will also, we will be developing some model policies uh, specific to California. And that's, as Andrew said, we do, we feel like individualized assistance is always the best approach. Um, but we do have, we've developed um, some policies for Minnesota specific work. Um, and then we will also, we will have some of those for California. We don't have anything specifically um, related to um, abandon the sale of e-cigarettes. And I know that you've had been working with some model policies in the past and we are, you know, we're in the process of reviewing those and kind of identifying what the priority areas are for um, developing new policies and reviewing those that are, that are out there. So um, we will be developing them. We're still um, really in the process, uh, but we certainly would welcome any feedback on areas where you think that there's a specific need. Um, another question is, is your team available to provide TA to city attorneys or city management? I'll talk about that again, because <laughs> uh, I highlighted it, highlighted that in my conversation earlier. Yeah, we've worked with uh, different government attorneys, including city attorneys and county attorneys to um, work towards adopting and implementing tobacco control policies. And yes, if we are uh, contacted by people in need, we will provide based on our knowledge and the, uh, the evidence based, that we've, based on best practices, we will th do the best we can to work collaboratively with uh, city attorneys and city management. But also another thing that we need to um, understand is that we there are some lines that we cannot cross that will involve lobbying so and that's something that we'll highlight right away if it's something that goes into um, some type of work where we talk directly with uh, policy makers we might take a step back because we want people to be involved in developing policies that are suitable to their communities but what we do is to give an opinion is to give educational information all based on our experience on what uh, could be done to be included in our policy that will achieve public health goals. So I feel like I'm talking too much, but <laughs> uh, the other question is who and how do we contact, whom and how do we contact to review draft ordinances that are ready to go to the city council? Joel. Well, that. I think as Mark mentioned, Mark triage is our TA request, and so for now, um, he's the best first point of contact. Um, and then Andrew is going to work extensively on the California program, so either of um, either of them would be great first points of contact. But also, as Mark said, um, you know, we don't we're we're not a, we have 14 attorneys working on this. We all sit relatively close to each other. We will make whoever gets your request will make sure that someone gets back to you to help you. So any one of us that you sent an email to or gave a call to would make sure that the right person who can assist you gets back to you as soon as possible. Great. Next question. Have you, um, will your project in California address tobacco waste? Yeah, my, <laughs> sure, I, can, I can handle that one. Um, <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, the answer is yes, and we're very excited to do some of this work. This is some of the uh, very innovative policies that's happening in California that we're excited to work on. So we've worked in the past, we were had a small grant with Tom Novotny's group out of California to do some work on this and produce some publications a few years ago. And that's recently been kind of reinvigorated in our office. We have a couple attorneys who come from an environmental law background and who are very excited to be doing this work. So uh, we have a couple publications that are in the pipeline uh, to come out on this topic. And we're certainly willing to uh, work on policy review and policy development if you're talking about uh, you know, sales bans on, sales restrictions on uh, filtered cigarettes or um, policies that address tobacco waste in other areas. I would just, can I add to that? Yeah, just that um, 
our very enthusiastic environmental law colleagues um, are also have a couple of accepted abstracts at the National Conference on Tobacco or Health that's coming up right um, in town here in Minneapolis um, in, at the end of August. And so if you happen to be attending NCTOH, make sure to check out those presentations. Um, we do, not everyone can come, we know, and so we do intend to translate those presentations into some webinars as well that will be um, broadcast nationally and archived on our website. Great. And I also want to acknowledge this question that uh, is in the same vein, but I want to point it out because it's, it's on the same uh, level, the same, touches the same subject uh, that Mike and Joelle talked about. Do you have experience working to reduce tobacco waste e-cigarette but uh, cigarette butts e uh, ec cartridges such as such as extended producer responsibility policies or product salesmen so that that everything that my colleagues addressed um addresses that question as well yeah and the publications we have in the pipeline uh talk specifically about extended producer responsibility and product stewardship so those those are areas we would like to work in as well the other question regards um working on policies to prohibit sale of tobacco in pharmacies. Um, Mark, that's okay. um, I'm trying to think we have, we, we definitely have um, that followed the policies very closely. I don't know, if, I think, well, actually, yeah, no, I should say we have, sorry, um, <laughs> we have worked specifically and directly on some um, in communities that have um, prohibited the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. It's, it's not a, um, it's actually not a super complicated policy, and it usually fits in ideally with an existing uh, tobacco retail um, policy, uh, but it doesn't have to. But yeah, we certainly could work with you on that. Yes. Uh, just to add to that too, uh, the you know, Andrew mentioned we don't always recommend a model policy, but one area we did develop a model policy in is uh, a licensing or model licensing ordinance for Minnesota communities, and that did include a uh, pharmacy uh, tobacco ban. Too. So that is um, an area we've developed policies and would be very happy to work on. Uh, yeah, so there's a question here that in the past, ALSC was able to provide public comments with this new grant cycle, can ALSC lobby? So Lindsay, do you want to take that one? I'd love to. Um, in the past, any public comments that anyone from um, the Lung Association have provided have not been provided under the grant. Um, so just making sure that that's clear, we're not doing any lobbying with any grant dollars anywhere, that's not happening. Um, but we do have funding that is not grant dollars that can go uh, so that um, some of us on staff are able to provide those public comments and do lobbying. So um, if and when that happens, please, uh, you can reach out and and we can determine if we have staff that are not grant funded that are able to do that. Great. Um, we are coming out of time, but there's another question here on, have you worked with community colleges and healthcare facilities for smoke-free policies? Please describe. And I can talk about that. Uh, yes, we have worked on um, in a smoke-free communities uh, project. We've worked on different policies to address not only just smoking but tobacco in those areas in schools, in college campuses, and uh, health facilities. So we most of, typically what we do is that we are uh, contacted by those communities uh, to ask us to review their policies and review them and give them feedback based on um, the best practices that we have. So yes, that's something that we've worked on. And I think we are on time. So thank you for joining us. Again, we're really, 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 <laughs> really excited to be partnering with ALA and working in California. Uh, you've put the names to the faces and feel free to contact any one of us or all of us, whatever time, and will be available to uh, answer your questions or any, any other concerns that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.